For the, the workshop I'm going to be giving today is uh, full stack with Dino and Dino Deploy. Um, and what that means is we're going to be building an application, a full stack application um, using Dino, deploying it to Dino Deploy and checking out all the cool features that Dino gives us and how it makes it really easy to do that. Um, so what are we specifically building? We're going to be building a blog. Um, uh, this blog is going to have an index page, which lists all the blog entries. It's going to have um, a page for each of the blog entries. Uh, we're going to be using some dynamic server-side rendering to personalize the page for each user. Specifically, we're going to render the dates on the page um, using the user's preferred locale. So if we have a user coming from Italy, for example, um, it'll render the dates in the Italian style. If they're from the UK, it'll render it in English in the UK style. In the US, it'll put the month first, um, stuff like that. We're also gonna have a page to let the user adjust these preferences. So that's gonna be like some interactivity that's gonna happen there. Um, I'll show you this in action in just a second. And um, we're not going to actually have an editor for the blog articles or anything like that. Blog articles are gonna be markdown files that are checked into a Git repository. Um, like many of you, if you have a blog, that's probably how you manage your, your blog articles. Um, so let me quickly demonstrate this. Uh, there is a link. Um, let me share this in chat. Oh, that does not work. <clears throat> this is what we're going to be building today. Um, so here we have our th this this blog. Um, let me know if, if I need to zoom in any further or if this is large enough. Um, where you can see all the blog articles. If you click on them, you, you go to the blog page. Um, you have your date, your title, the content of the blog. Um, you can have multiple articles. Uh, this is all like nice markdown rendering. And you can see here that currently this is rendered in um, the UK format. So date, month, year. Um, same here, this is in English. If I go to my Chrome settings, um, oh. Typing too quickly. <laughs> language. And I set my language to English or to, to US. It'll uh, switch these around here. Um, if I set it to German, for example, it will use a completely different formatting and it'll start like speaking to German in me here. Um, and we'll also, we also have the settings page where you can see what current locale you have selected. Um, so currently we're using the one that the browser sent us, which is German. I can force it to be Italian, for example, and you can actually see while I'm typing here, it'll tell me some um, information. So this is some interactivity that we're gonna be building into our application. Um, so I can type in Japan, for example, and it'll give me, it'll tell me what the name of the language is and what a, a sample of time in that language would look like. And if I hit save, um, it, persist these settings. And if I go look at the date now, it'll it'll say this in, Japan, in Japanese. Okay, so uh, that's what we're gonna be building. Um, how are we gonna be building it? So we're gonna be using Dino. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Dino, uh, the like five second thing is it's a modern JavaScript TypeScript runtime. Um, so like Node.js from the same people, except it supports TypeScript, which Node.js doesn't. Um, from the same people that had originally built Node.js, so Ryan Dahl, Bert Belder, um, the, those folks. Um, and it contains a fully integrated tool chain, which is different to Node. It has built-in formatter, built-in linter, built-in testing framework, um, and it uses a lot more modern JavaScript features like promises um, everywhere. And it tries to stick to web APIs where possible. So for example, there's no custom HTTP server or HTTP client. Um, it is using fetch like a browser would. Um, I am, I work on Dino full time. Um, I am one of the engineers working on it. We have a team of, I think 15 folks working on Dino right now, um, working at the Dino company, building Dino. Uh, but the Dino company also has an, a, a second product, which is Dino deploy, which is an edge runtime for Dino applications. So for those who aren't familiar with what that means, um, an edge runtime is, I don't know if you're familiar with Cloudflow workers, um, a a way to run some code all over the world, really close to users and in a bunch of different locations. So whenever a user makes a request and you need to do like server side rendering or anything like that, it happens really close to the user, which minimizes the latency required. 
Um, for example, if you have a user in, in Germany making a request to your service, uh, that could be served by a server in Germany rather than having to travel under the ocean to a server in the US somewhere. Uh, Dino Deploy powers a bunch of services, for example, Dino.land, our website, um, all of our web properties actually. Um, it's a, it um, powers Netlify's edge function offering, uh, Superbase's edge functions as well. Um, and there's, there's a bunch more, you can find them on our website. Um, and lastly, we're gonna be using Fresh, which is a full stack web framework for Dino that uses Preact, is optimized for fast, robust, and scalable applications, has no build step, and ships no JavaScript to the client by default. Um, so Fresh is, uh, it, you can think of it like Next.js or Remix, um, but built for Dino. Um, and trying to really make use of all of the features um, of Dino, um, like all the tool chain features um, as best you can. Part of that is having a build step. Um, yeah, so this is what it's gonna look like. I, I gave you a demo of that a second ago. Um, you can check it out here again if you want to. And now uh, about following along at home, uh, please do. Um, the source code we're working towards is available at this repository here, um, Luca Casanato slash Fresh Workshop. Um, you can see here in the commit log, um, there's a bunch of commits here. Um, each of these is like one little step that we're going to be taking in the workshop today. Um, and yeah, so if you ever get um, stuck, um, you can just get checkout at any one of these commits and continue working from there. So for example, let's say we're currently working on this and you just cannot get it to work. Um, you can check out this commit and then continue on from there uh, rather than being able being stuck for the next two hours, for example. <clears throat> And um, the other thing is, if you have any questions, if you see anything that's unclear, please like just unmute yourself and like shout it out into the room, uh, in, like interrupt me um, and I'll try to explain it right, in real time. I think that's much easier than, than um, if, if you ask them in Discord or in chat and, and then I don't see them and it takes a while for me to answer. And don't forget that you can always rewatch the workshop at your own rate later. Um, so if there's anything that's that you miss, it's going too fast for you. Um, Feel free to just drop out with with the um, following along at home by writing source code, and instead just uh, watch and listen. And um, you can always try this later um, in your own time. Uh, Luca, uh, yeah, I can't access the uh, repo. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I typed it wrong or something like that. No, I it's on private still. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, let's fix that one second. Okay, should be public now. Sorry for that. Um, and then let's uh, head to the prerequisites. So you need to have Dino installed. Um, I had put this on the on the JS Nation website earlier. Um, so I hope you have Dino installed <laughs> and have the Dino integration for your editor set up. Um, there's a manual page for how to do this. It's also linked on the JS Nation website. Um, and if you want to de deploy your code to Dino Deploy, this is not mandatory. Like if you don't, if you just want to play around with it locally, that's totally cool. Um, but if you want to deploy your code, you do need to have a GitHub account and a GitHub repo to be able to push your code to. Um, so just, yeah, that's that's important. Okay, uh, so that's all of the like boilerplate out of the way. Um, I think we can get started with coding. Um, so first thing first is need to create a new project. So uh, I have a Git repo here, um, which has nothing in it. It only has this settings.json file in it, which set which tells VS Code that this is a Dino workspace and it should use the Dino extension. Um, nothing else in here. And I, I'm just going to create a new Dino project and you will see that there's really nothing to this. Um, so let me just log out hello world and then Dino run dash a, you know, TS. And you can see this just runs. Uh, there is, Dino has no package JSON file or node modules folder or anything like that. Um, you just create your file, start typing code in it. So that's how you create a project in Dino. But um, Fresh, has fresh is like a, an opinionated framework which gives you um, a, a nice set of defaults to work from and um, 
for that to work best, it gives you a little init script. Uh, here, let me go to the website. Um, a little init script that you can run that scaffolds out your project. Um, so what you can do is you can go to fresh.dnode.dev, uh, copy this um, command here, and let's remove this file, and then it'll just initialize a project for you. And it might ask you a few questions, um, just answer yes to all of them. Um, and then you'll see it generates this folder structure here. Um, and this folder structure is the, the most basic fresh app you can have. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through what all these files mean in just a moment. Um, but first thing, let's, what we'll do is run Dino task start to start the project. Um, oh, I apparently already have a server running. Oh, right, this is my reference project. Um, okay, let's do that again. And now it starts up the server and I can listen, I can go to localhost 8000 and see this um, page that is being hosted from um, my freshly initialized project. Uh, so let's go through all of the files here. Um, First thing is this main.ts file. This is the entry point to your project. Um, I'm not gonna explain all of the details of everything that is happening here because I don't think it's super interesting. Um, if you wanna learn more about this, you can go to uh, the fresh documentation and run through this getting started tutorial later. And um, part of this is it will tell you what all these files do and, and what is in them. Um, I'll just give you the, the important details here. Um, the, the important thing, this is all boilerplate, you don't really need to care about it, is this routes folder, which um, might look very familiar if you've used Next.js before. Um, it is essentially one file per route of your application. So there's this index.tsx file. Um, sorry, let me... Okay, there we go. Get rid of all the errors. Um, yeah, so this index.tsx file, this is... Um, what is rendered when you go to uh, localhost 8000 without any um, any path. So the index page, um, you can edit things in here. Let's edit this and you will see that it refreshes automatically and updates. Um, and I have my counter here as well. I'll, I'll show you what that is in just a second as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I can, I can change things here and it'll update on the page automatically. Um, I have this, uh, actually, I'm not gonna explain what these two are. We will just delete them and get to them later. Um, and the islands, we're also gonna get to those later. Um, so what we're gonna do for now is just get rid of everything that's in here and uh, put in a random hello world. Okay, so um, this project is using a Preact. Um, with JSX, so these are JSX components, um, which have, uh, which is like a templating language for um, for JavaScript. If you've used React before, you'll you'll know what this is. Um, and we're using Tailwind for styling. Um, and if you've never used Tailwind before, uh, let's Tailwind CSS. Um, it is a uh, CSS utility framework um, which. Uh, yeah, allows you to do styling through purely CSS classes without having to write any CSS itself. Um, and this, the way this works is um, through this template literal here that um, you put on your JSX classes, it will um, automatically generate just the CSS that is necessary to render this page. Um, so if I look at the page source, um, you can see that, uh, so all of this is just a CSS reset. You don't need to do, care about any of this, but you can see there's uh, three CSS um, classes here, and it is generated just these, these three classes. So MX auto, P4, and max width screen MD. So this is really, really size efficient. It allows you to make super small sites. Um, one other thing that you can see is if I open the web inspector, go to the network panel and hit refresh, is that uh, no JavaScript is loaded. Actually, there's I am not quite true. A little bit of JavaScript is loaded just to make the hot refresh work, um, but there's no application JavaScript loaded. This is a purely static page um, because 
there's no interactivity here, right? Um, because there's no interactivity, we don't need to send any JavaScript to the client. Um, so we don't slow down the client, the client by giving a JavaScript it doesn't need. Um, this is different to if you're using Next.js, for example, um, it will send the entire client renderer to the browser by default always. Um, so you'll get like a 70 kilobyte JavaScript bundle that's sent to the browser, um, even for like a Hello World page like this without any interactivity. And you'll see uh, during the course of this workshop that you really don't need much JavaScript on the client. Like you can have a really great experience with little to no JavaScript. Okay, so this is our scaffold. Um, let me commit this scaffold um, and push it to my repo and go back to my slides to see what we're doing next. Um, so first thing we wanna do is add some blog posts um, that are actually going to be shown on, that we actually wanna show later. Uh, so I'll create a data folder um, and a posts folder and create some blog posts. So the first one's gonna be hello. Uh, it's gonna have some front matter at the top to give it things like the title, uh, the publish date, um, publish, no, sorry, publish at, and this needs to be a uh, ISO date. That's what it's gonna say it was published right now. And we're gonna need a snippet as well. So this is what is shown in like um, the meta description. So what Google would show, for example, if you search for this page, um, or what is shown on the index page as the summary of the, the blog post. So this is the first post. And now after this, I can just have, oh, sorry, let me disable Copilot actually. This is gonna be really annoying otherwise. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, and then this is just regular markdown. So you can have uh, your, your content here. So this is my first uh, blog post on my new blog. And this is a markdown syntax here to make things italic. Um, and you can actually see what, I don't know if you saw that, if you caught that, um, but if I press control S, this saves and formats things automatically. And this formatter that it's using is actually Dino's formatter. Um, so Dino has a built-in formatter, it can run Dino FMT and it will format all the files in my directory. Uh, so I can do this for example. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, that's like some weird markdown syntax with the two tabs. Um, but yeah, it'll format all the files in my inventory, so in, in my um, directory. This is like prettier. Um, it puts markdown, JavaScript, TypeScript, JSON, uh, and a couple others. Um, okay, so first post, let's add a second post, uh, just so we have a little bit more variety. Second post, let's have this one be published tomorrow. And uh, let's have for this one, add some subtitles. Um, and maybe let's add a table. Um, so this is the markdown table. And uh, you'll see why I'm doing this in just in a bit. Okay, so the, there's our table. We have our two blog posts. Um, one other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna define a, um, a TypeScript type um, which represents each of our blog posts. We're gonna be using this in a couple of places later. It's easier if we do it up front. Um, so this TypeScript type is going to um, have the ID of the, I thought I disabled Copilot. Okay, oh, AI, terrible. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it has an ID. The ID is the thing that you'll see in the URL bar. Um, so for this hello blog post, it's gonna be, you go to slash blog slash uh, hello. So the ID is going to be hello for that one. Uh, for the second one, it's going to be second is the ID. Uh, the title is the string that um, is this string up here in the front matter. Uh, then we have our uh, publish at date, which is just a JavaScript date object. Um, then what else do we have? We have the snippet which is a string and we have the content, which is also a string. And the content is just like everything after the front matter. So the, the markdown content itself. Okay, so uh, we have our posts, we have a type for our post. Um, next thing, let's add a page for showing the individual blog posts. And let me commit this. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add a log folder. And in there, we're going to add a file called id.ts ID with uh, square brackets around it. And what these are, oh, sorry, .tsx actually. Uh, so what these square brackets mean is that that means this is a dynamic variable. Um, so this will not just match um, blog slash ID as a path, but it will match blog slash anything really. Uh, so uh, let me just copy this in here so we have uh, something to look at. And then you'll see if I type in slash blog, this doesn't match anything because there's no blog slash index dot TSX, but uh, blog slash hello matches something blog slash hello two, uh, blog slash second, this all works because this is a dynamic parameter. Um, for now, let's just hard code the blog post data. Um, we'll get to loading loading in a second, but um, let's take things one step at a time. So for now, we're just gonna hard code things. Copilot managed to enable it itself again. This is, I'm just gonna uninstall the extension. Bye. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, right, so we should probably import this uh, post type. Uh, so we'll have a publish update. Let's just do a new date. So that is right now. Uh, we need some content. Um, this is all just placeholder for, for creating the actual page right now. And this is my first post. <clears throat> okay, so we have our uh, post data here uh, that is currently static. We're gonna make that dynamic in a bit, um, but let's start with just styling the page. Uh, so let's go back to what this is meant to look like. Uh, so we have the date, then we have a title, then we have the blog content. Um, so let's start with a date. Um, let's do post dot publish at, um, and what is it, a call date string? Yeah, so this formats it into a string. Uh, let's give it some styling. Um, let's make this text gray 600. So make it not be black, but um, make a slightly lighter gray to make it stand out less. Then let's add the title of the post. Um, let's style this one as well. Uh, so this one's gonna be a text, uh, I think five XL. And let's do a, uh, oh, that is the wrong one. Okay, uh, yeah, that looks cool. Let's add a margin top to this one as well. Uh, let's do 12 maybe. That looks good. And let's make this bold as well. Cool. Okay. That looks uh, pretty close. Yeah. Um, then next, we're going to add the content. Um, we're not going to deal with markdown rendering right now. We're going to get to that later. Um, let's try to keep it as simple as possible for now. And let's add some top margin to this one as well. Uh, so let's do eight top margin. Uh, actually, let's do 12 as well. Cool. Okay. So uh, we have our blog post rendering. Um, pretty simple. Right now, our post data is still hard-coded though. Let's change that. Um, so basic rendering of blog. Okay. So how do we do dynamic rendering? Um, so as you can see, this, this um, function here, which is actually called wrong, um, let's just rename it, um, is synchronous and data loading is usually asynchronous. So um, to do asynchronous loading, we need some sort of loader function um, that actually lets us uh, yeah, load some data asynchronously. We can't just make this function asynchronous. That doesn't work. Um, the, the page, like everything's going to completely freak out. You can see it just turns white there. Um, so we have to have some sort of loader hook somewhere. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Before we do that, we need to figure out, let's create some utilities for actually um, turning the ID. So this thing up here into this blog post struct. So let's start by creating a new function, async function. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, exactly. Uh, load post. So this is going to take the ID as a parameter and it's going to return a promise of post or null. Um, so this is going to return uh, the post structure, or if the ID was not found, it'll return null. 
because it's obviously possible that um, you don't find a blog post to render. Um, yeah, actually, before I'm going to do that, is there are there any questions right now? Um, does anyone have questions so far? I'm, I'm sort of racing ahead. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Oh, it looks, looks pretty great. Okay, cool. Um, so that's great here. Thank you. Um, okay, so then what we're going to just continue on here. So first thing we're going to do is load the text from disk. We're going to do this in a try catch. I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say text is equal to await dino dot read file a read text file. This is the Dino function for reading, as it says, a text file from disk. It takes as the first argument the path where you want to load from. Um, in our case, it's going to be data posts id.md. And what we're going to do is if this throws an error, and if the error is an instance of the Dino errors uh, not found, um, then we return null. So this just means if we're loading a post and the post doesn't exist, uh, we'll return null. And in all other case, we'll rethrow the error. Um, and then we can handle that later. Uh, so at this point, we have a we, ha we have the content of this file. And if you remember, it starts out with the bit of front matter and then it contains the contents. The first thing we're going to need to do is parse out the front matter from the top of this file. And to do that, we're going to use a front matter parsing library called, um, oh, actually, it doesn't have a name actually because it's part of DinoLand STD. Um, what is DinoLand STD? It is the DinoLand standard library. So um, the standard library is a bunch of utility functions, um, little, uh, yeah, like UID, for example, UID generation dealing with streams, um, some, some more advanced file system operations, .env, uh, this front matter parsing is one of them. Uh, it's encoding front matter. Um, so this is just a TypeScript library, essentially, that is maintained by the Dino core team um, next to the Dino project itself. And um, yeah, it gives you a bunch of utilities, which you would usually have to import some third party libraries from in other ecosystems. And this is like audited and tested by the Dino team to the same um, like standards as the Dino project itself. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to import um, the front matter parser from the front matter library here. Uh, so extract, import extract from front matter. Um, and Can you I will see one thing here. Yeah. Why do you immediately have the types? You just paste it and you have the types already for the extract. Uh, yes. Well, actually, so I'm kind of cheating because I've done this like earlier this morning and I, so I already have everything cached. Usually the way this would look, um, let me actually just showcase what that would look like. Um, so if I import a version, which I don't have cached, so I don't know, the 144 release, it'll, it'll be in red and it'll say that this is un an uncached or missing remote URL. What I can do is I can press control dot and then click on cache and it'll automatically cache this, um, or it'll just pull it down automatically while I'm running. Um, so this is like the way it works in a browser. The first time it encounters a dependency that it hasn't downloaded yet, it'll go download it. Um, and then it'll cache it forever in in, in the cache directory. For Dino, this is called the Dino info, or sorry, the Dino dir, which is like the Dino cache directory. You can, if you type in Dino info, you'll find the location of this cache directory. And uh, you can see like all of the dependencies that are downloaded are, are stored in here forever. It's not meant to be navigated by users, um, which is why these are all like terrible names, but yeah, it's, it's all stored in here. Very cool. Thanks. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, so one thing you'll see is that Dino imports dependencies from remote modules, um, so from URLs, just like the browser does. This is different to Node. In Node, you import modules from the Node modules directory, um, and you put stuff into the Node modules directory using npm um, and pulling it from 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 uh, yeah the npm registry. 
um, and you have to use a package JSON to do that. In Dino, you just encode the dependencies directly into your source code. Um, but sometimes this is not super like useful. Sometimes you want to import the same module in a bunch of different places, for example. And if you have to retype this dependent, this whole long specifier every time, that can be that can get quite annoying. Um, so Dino has support for a browser standard called import maps, which allow you to remap um, specifiers like uh, like beer specifiers. So things like I don't know Preact or this at Tailwind um, to URLs. Um, and browser support, the Chrome supports this. It's being implemented in Firefox right now. Um, and this essentially allows you to customize how how the system does module resolution. So what we can do, we can add a new rule here that says if something starts with um, dollar sign std slash, then replace that with with this https you know, land slash std at version one forty five. And now I can do this instead in my imports. And this is much cleaner now. If I need to change the version, there's just a single place where I change the version rather than having to grep through all my files and change it in a bunch of different places. So uh, with all that said, I'm now importing this front matter module and I have this extract function that I'm importing from there. Um, and I can call this extract function with the text and it returns a object with attributes and body. And this attributes, this is the front matter itself, parsed is YAML and the body is everything after the front matter, so the content. Um, what we are going to do is we will, uh, so this, this attributes currently has an unknown type. Let's um, cast it to a different type. Uh, we're not gonna do like any input validation right now because that's out of scope for this workshop. But if you were to want to do import validation here, you could check like, is this actually an object? Does it only have string? keys and does it only have string values? Um, did a user put an array into the front matter instead of an object, for example? Um, but yeah, that's, we're not gonna do that right now. Um, the parameters, this is going to have the title or, uh, sorry, let me open one of these posts so you can see what it actually looks like. This is going to have the title, the publish at and the snippet. Um, so let's, the first thing we're gonna do is parse this um, publish at as a date, um, because right now it is just a string. We want it to be a date. So we'll do params dot publish at um, and pass that to the new date constructor and that'll just parse it. Um, and then for the rest, we'll return an object um, which has the ID, which is just the thing that's passed into this function. Uh, the title is params params dot title. The publish at is the date. Uh, the snippet is also passed in by the params snippet and the content is the body. Okay, so now we have this load post function which um, loads a post by its ID and uh, parses out all the data. So let's see if this works. We can do this using just the Dino uh, readable print loop. So without integrating this into the application right now. So what I'll do is I will import, I'll, I'll start up Dino um, and then let me copy the relative path here and then do import load post from uh, dot slash utils post.ts and that will import this file. And now if I call load post uh, I need to specify the ID, so that's hello. Um, you will see that this loads the file correctly. Um, it has the date, it has the publish at, the snippet, the content. Um, I can also do this with uh, load post second. And uh, you see this works just as well. Here's the on un, un, uh, pretty printed markdown. Um, okay, cool. So this function works. Um, we should probably make sure that it continues working into the future though. Let's commit this real quick. Add uh, load post function. So how do you make sure something continues working into the future? Well, you add a test. Um, 
And usually people skip writing tests because it's like too complicated to set up or um, it's like too much maintenance to keep them running. Dino tries to make this so super simple that like you have no excuses for not writing tests. Um, so to create a new test, the only thing you do is you create a file and you end it with underscore test.ts or .js or .tsx or .jsx um, or any number of other supported file extensions for Dino. And what you then do is you call dino.test in here, you give it a name. Um, so we're going to be testing load post. Um, we're going to give it a function to test. So this is the function we wanted to test. And we're just going to call await load. Uh, oh, sorry, what is it called? Load post. Load post hello. And um, this will so far only test that it's actually loading something which is not there. I can, I can just press this little green button here and it integrates nicely into VS Code. It'll like run the test. I can also run Dino test dash A and it'll run the test this way. Um, but I probably also want to check that this post is like actually not null. Um, so let me import some assertions. Um, we can do this from the standard library again. So std slash uh, testing asserts.ts. And let's do assert and assert equals. So let's assert that post is not null and assert equals that post.id is hello. Can run this test again, still passes. Um, let's make the test fail just to see that it's actually running the test. So uh, it, it fails now because it does, it does not equal hello to, it equals just hello. Um, and yeah, you could have uh, a second test here, which tests for uh, load post non-existent where I load a post that does not exist. This post does not exist. Um, and now it's going to assert that post is equal to null. And I can run this one as well. And it also passes. Um, and I can run them from the command line. And they both pass. OK, so that's how to write tests. And I hope this shows that it's like so easy to write tests that you have no excuses to not write tests. Um, and yeah, if you still think there are excuses, then please reach out to me. And we will make sure that the excuses will be gone in the next release. Because um, writing tests is important, people. <laughs> OK, so. Um, uh, Luca? I have a mm -hmm. question. Um, is it possible to use uh, libraries like JS to write tests or um, is it the only option? Yeah, so um, you can't use JEST specifically, but you, what you probably don't care specifically to use JEST, but you probably want to have the syntax like JEST, right? Um, where you have the describe and it and stuff like that. And that is possible. So there's a, um, in the STD library, there's something called BDD, which is behavior driven tests. And this essentially looks like just test system. Uh, so if I wanted to rewrite my tests using this, we could totally do that. Uh, let me show you how that would work. Uh, describe it. So I could describe load posts. And I could it uh, loads successfully and this da, da, da. and I can do that and this just integrates right into Dino test so if I do Dino test a it'll still run this test and it'll like show it correctly here um, so this is possible and the other thing is that you might not want to use assertions like this but you're maybe more familiar with expect um, so that would be uh, I, th I think try is the one with expect right is it? Yeah, it is. Um, so you can like import chai uh, as well. And then you can do, uh, uh, let's see here, import expect. So we can do like expect post. Oh, let's get the text for this. Expect post hello. Okay, well, uh, expose. I, I don't know that 
try syntax works, but to be, no, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Does that work? Uh, it's okay. Yeah, I get it. Thanks. But yeah, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So let's. Okay. Um, any other questions on testing? Or can we move on? It's probably not for the scope of this workshop, but I think that by just it's not just the ability syntax. There are other things like snapshot testing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think that like there's, I, I'm pretty sure that it's not currently supported in in Dino library as the, uh, the standard library, but maybe we can add one, like we can write one or something like that. Yeah. So actually, snapshot testing is something we added really recently. Um, it is supported now. Um, I've never used it myself, but uh, there's this snapshot testing framework. Um, yeah, there's some documentation on it somewhere, um, but mm -hmm. I'm not the right person to use it. But it does exist now, <laughs> which is cool. Um, and there's some other features which I haven't demonstrated, like you can run tests in parallel with a jobs flag. Um, and yes, you can like lock down permission or yeah, I've covered permissions at all, but if you know what those are, you can lock down permissions for each test as well. There's the testing framework is pretty advanced, um, but it has a really nice simple interface to get started with. Okay, um, cool. So moving on from testing, let's um, right testing tangent up there already. Um, let's dynamically load the post data on our blog post page. So right now we have the posts hard coded here. Instead of hard coding them, let's uh, get them dynamically. So to do this, we're going to need, as I alluded to earlier, some sort of loader function because this cannot be asynchronous. So we need to do the asynchronous work sometime upfront before actually doing the rendering. And to do this, Fresh supports um, something called handlers. And handlers um, are, um, they, yeah, how do I explain handlers best? Ha like handlers are essentially a way for you to intercept uh, the request and response handling completely. Um, so by default, if I don't specify any handlers, Fresh for each route will just render the default exported component. Um, but API routes, for example, may not have a defaulted exported component, right? They may, may want to handle like post requests there instead of get requests. Or you may want to handle, um, I don't know, get requests you want to handle with, with um, like rendering the page, but a post request you want to like parse the JSON out of the request body or, or something like that. Um, so to do that, you do use handlers. So uh, let's export const handler and uh, let's import the types for this because I get really lost if my types don't complete properly. Uh, so fresh server.ts. And we're gonna import the handlers type and we can now create a handler for get. This can be asynchronous. Um, it is going to take a request and a context, and I will explain what both of these are in just a moment. And it returns a response. Um, so this is just the same response that you get from a fetch, for example. And what you can actually do here is, um, let's say you don't want to render this page at all, let's not render the page and instead just return ASD ASD for all of our pages. Uh, it's kind of stupid, but whatever, it's possible. So I've now completely intercepted rendering and instead of rendering, I'm now returning this static response here. It's not quite what we want, what we want to do. We actually want to render the page. So we're going to call context.render, which renders out the component. And this returns a response. Um, so uh, yeah, this doesn't work right now because post is not defined. We'll get there in a second. Um, then we, to be able to load the right component um, or the load the right post, we need to get the ID out of the URL. Um, we can also get this from the context. So the context has this parameters uh, field, which contains all of the URL parameters. Uh, so in this case, there will be an ID parameter, um, which we can, uh, for the time being, maybe we'll just like log out the ID. And if I scroll up to above where the error is, um, I'm currently loading the second page and it prints out second. So this is definitely there. Um, so I can now load my post with the utility function we wrote just a minute ago. 
pass in the ID and we now have a post um, and I can pass this post to my render function. And what this is going to do is it's going to pass all of the arguments that I passed to my render function to the data of my render function into my component here via the my component properties. Um, so yeah, the, the props here um, are of type page props and page props has um, this field called data. And this is set to whatever you pass into the render function. So if you pass the post into the render function, it'll return, um, it, that'll be set on the data. If you can see right now, it says data is any, um, and you can also see here that render is, that the data is any here as well, um, right here. This is not very nice for type safety. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we can pass, we, we can tell the handler and the page props that um, we want to ensure that the right type is passed in um, to the, the render function and this right type is returned from the data here. Um, you will see that this immediately errors out because post is of type post or null and um, render has to be of type post or undefined. The undefined, uh, yeah, that's part of fresh how fresh works. Um, you don't have to care about that right now. Um, but yeah, the important part is that um, this null cannot fit in there because null is neither undefined or is the post. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, if there's no post, we're gonna just return a new response page not found status 404 or actually post not found. Um, and if we can now go to our page, you will see this actually works. So if I go to my hello blog post, it'll show the um, hello data. If I go to my second blog post, it shows the second post data. If I go to a page which doesn't exist, it'll show post not found. Um, you probably wanna have a nicer error page than this. Uh, you can do this by, um, for example, passing a argument to your render function, which is like error true um, or something like that instead of your post. And then like you can do, I don't know, if error is true, uh, render out a different page. And because this is all server side rendered, it doesn't, like, it's not bad for your performance or anything like that to, to um, have more code in your render functions or handlers. Um, yeah, uh, are there any questions regarding handlers or passing data um, to the render function, anything like that? No, okay, cool. Uh, well, that's nice to hear. Um, so yeah, uh, next thing we need to do is um, if you go to the homepage right now, the index page, you'll see it still just says hello world. There's no listing of um, blog posts here yet. If I go back to the reference, you'll see there's this nice um, list of all the blog posts sorted by um, the, the day when they were published. So to do that, first thing we're gonna need is we're gonna need another uh, loader or like load function here that actually loads all of the posts. So let's create another function, export async function, um, list posts. This is not gonna take any arguments because this returns all posts and it's gonna return a promise of post array. So it's gonna return an array of posts. Um, so how do you actually, so what we want to do is we want to list out all of the files inside of the post directory. Um, then we want to open those files to get out all the metadata and then return, then sort it by the date timestamp um, because we want to the oldest one to be last, um, like the newest, we want the newest post at the top. Um, and you can see here, that's not necessarily the order they are in the directory. Um, so we want to do that and uh, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. So that's what we want to do. So first thing we want to do is open all of, or, or um, list all of the files in the directory. Uh, we can do that with a for wait loop, um, entry of dino.readdir. So dino.readdir is a function that returns an async iterator or an async iterable actually, um, of all of the directory entries in a folder. Um, so we're going to go through the posts folder 
And for each of those entries, we are going to um, cons let's let's start by just console logging out the entries. Um, and for simplicity's sake, let's immediately add a test for this, so it will be easy to show what's going on. Um, so list posts async uh, posts. So we're going to do await list posts, and uh, then let's just console log out the posts. And if I, okay, uh, can I please see the output? Where is it here? Yeah, okay, so here's the output. Um, so you can see that each one of those entries, it, it found both of the entries, um, the hello dot markdown, the second dot markdown. Um, so that's working. So we wanna get the ID from the name now. So the name contains the dot MD extension. The ID does not, so we need to get rid of the dot MD extension. Um, easiest way of doing that is to just say the ID is the entry dot name, and then um, sorry entry dot name dot slice off the last three characters. So we want to start from the start to um, the end minus three. Uh, so this will like start here and then end, go to the back and then go three characters back. So that would be without the dot md. And if we console log that out now, uh, console log out the ID, run the test again, you can see this gets the IDs correctly. Uh, then we can just run, uh, let's see here. So we can get the posts or load the, load the post for that ID. Um, and let's create a, an array called posts. push post and return the posts. And um, if you remember this load post can return post or null. Um, we don't care about the or null because we, we just checked that this file exists. Um, like the system just told us the file exists. So it's probably not gonna return null. It's probably safe to cast this. Um, uh, so you can see here now we have all of the posts loaded. Um, for the, yeah, okay, before we go on to the problem with this code, let's actually sort um, the posts by date. Um, so we're gonna use the sort method on an, on arrays, as it's built into JavaScript. Um, this is going to return the, um, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna do this. Um, yeah, so this is going to return the first uh, like two posts, and then we have to compare these posts. Um, so if post um, A is older than post B, we want to return a negative number. If it is newer than post B, we want to return a positive number. And if they are the same age, we want to return zero. Um, and using just that information, the sorting algorithm can figure out what order they need to go um, for them to yeah all be in order. Um, so we can do that with a dot or a dot publish at or publish at that's a JavaScript date object. We can get time. This is the Unix timestamp. So uh, the number of seconds or the number of milliseconds since um, January 1st, 1970, an ever increasing number essentially. Um, and we can subtract this from b dot publish at get time. And what this will do is if a is uh, larger than B, um, if, let me think, if A is larger than B, then this will return a positive number. And if B is larger than A, it will return a negative number. And if they're the same, it'll return zero. So this um, is exactly what the sort function wants. Let's run this and see if it sorts correctly. Um, oh, it actually does not sort correctly, uh, which means we probably need to sw switch around A and B. Um, let's try that again. <laughs> And it is now sorted correctly. So the second post comes first, the first post comes last because it was published before the first one. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. So yeah, sorting always very complicated. I, 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 I memorized this before the posts or before this talk and I still got it wrong. Um, so just, you just go on MDN and look it up there every time. <laughs> um, yeah, so this uh, is correct. This, this returns the correct data now. 
But for the observant of you, you may realize that this is not the most efficient way of doing this because we are loading all of the posts after each other. Um, so what await does is I, I like load the, sorry, um, I go to the first, um, uh, the first article or the first post, I load that, then I go back to the top of the array, then I look for the second one, I load that, then I do the next one on and on. If I have like a thousand posts, this is going to take, if load post takes one millisecond to complete, then this is going to take a total of a thousand milliseconds to complete because they all happen one after the other. You really don't want to be doing this in series like this. You want to do all of, you want to load all the posts in parallel. Um, so what we can do instead is we can do, create a new array called promises and not await here, but instead we promises.push the promise that is returned from this load post. So this load post returns a promise of post or null. And then we can do um, posts is equal to await promise.all promises as post array. So what this will do is it will start loading them all at once and then promise.all waits for all of them to complete. Um, and then they can all be running in the background in parallel. Um, and once they're all complete, then promise that all returns and we get the array of all of them. Um, and this is probably not too noticeable with, if you just have two posts, but if you have a hundred posts or a thousand posts, this is gonna become really, really noticeable um, because this is going to run much, much faster than um, doing it all synchronously. Oh, in, in series, sorry, not synchronously. Um, do you know actually has a built-in benchmarking framework that we could use to benchmark this. If we have time at the end, we can play around with that, but um, it, it works pretty similar to Dino tests. It's like you do Dino bench, um, yeah, Dino bench. Um, yeah, there's no bench modules in this directory, but um, yeah, it works really similar to Dino tests and it allows you to do benchmarks to like measure this and make sure it doesn't get worse in the future, for example. For something like this, probably not as relevant as if you're writing like a library to do image compression or something like that. And you want that to happen as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, so let's improve our test a little bit here um, by instead of just logging it out, let's assert that posts dot length is bigger than one um, or bigger or equal than one, we could say. Um, and let's assert, or let's get the last item. Um, let's assume there's never gonna be a blog post before this hello one. So to get the last one, we'll do posts at negative one. Um, this is a relatively new JavaScript feature. It allows you to, um, uh, this is very similar to like this, um, but it allows negative numbers as well. So negative numbers count from the back. Um, so I want the, the last item. So the end minus one, which is the last item. Um, we will assert that this item exists and we will then assert, e assert equals um, that last dot ID is equal to hello. And let's test this. And the test completes. So uh, cool, we have a working function to list all the posts. Are there any questions? Cool, no questions. Um, that means we can go on to add the index page that shows the list of all blog posts. Um, so if we go back to the reference page, you'll see we start with a big title here. Um, which is the name of the blog. And then each blog post has an entry, which has the name or the, the sorry, the date, and then the title and the summary. Uh, so let's do that. So let's start out with um, the title. Let's just copy the title from the blog post. So I don't have to type this again. Luca's blog. And if I go to localhost here, you will see that is there. Um, let's add a margin to this, just slightly bigger than two, 
workflow. That looks good. Um, and then let's add the list. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new component, which is called the post entry. Um, this takes the post as an argument. Um, Yes, it takes the post as an argument and it returns a list item. Um, we will install that in just a moment. Um, so we're going to do, uh, oh, right, we need to actually load the post first. Sorry, I forgot about that. So we're going to add a new handler first. Um, handlers, uh, let's import that from fresh server and have that return the post array. And we want something to happen on get requests. Uh, we don't need to care about the request or the context right now because we don't need to get any parameters from there because um, it returns the save data every time. Let's load the posts, await uh, uh, list posts. And then, oh, actually we do need the context, I forgot. So we need to call context surrender with the posts and we return the result of that. Then we can call, we can get the props in this component, which is going to be the post array again. So const posts is equal to props.data. And then we can, and we can go over each of these posts using the map function and uh, get the post and render a post entry component for each post. Um, and let's see, this did not work. Why did this not work? Uh, I, I must have done something wrong. Uh, oh, I did not export the handler. Right, if I don't export the answer, it obviously does not get invoked. Cool. Okay, so this works. Um, there, we're currently not actually showing anything. Let's just show the post title um, to see that it's working. Post.title. Oh. Const post is equal to props.post. And it shows the second post and the hello world post. Cool. Uh, let's add a slim top margin to this and improve the styling. Uh, so we're gonna have a border at the top, um, border top. We're gonna have some um, Y padding and we're going to, let's see here. Uh, I need to quickly look at my reference to what we're actually doing. One second. Um, we are, yes, right, okay. So we're going to create a link component here. So an A component, um, which is going to redirect us to the blog page for this component when I click on it. So we're just going to go to slash blog slash the ID. Um, and inside of here, we're going to have the date. Um, so the date is going to be uh, post dot publish at get. Uh, let's find it. Oh, the call a date string. That's the one. Um, and we want to display the title. Um, so post dot title. And we want to display the snippet. And this is currently no nice styling yet, but you can see it renders all the data. If I click on it, it sends me to the right page, which is exactly what we want. Okay, let's do styling. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is this should be a flex box. Um, let's actually move this py2 from here to here. So the click area gets larger. Um, we want this to have a uh, actually, let's do that in a second. Yeah, so this is a flex component. Uh, you can see it now renders them next to each other already. Um, if let's add a gap between the two things, um, that looks much better. 
we can now, um, let's see. So this, we want to make this larger. Um, so this is going to be bold. It's going to, uh, didn't I? Oh, it is not actually larger here. Okay, well, let's not make it larger then. Actually, no, let's let it, let's make it larger. Larger, that's nicer. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, we have that. And we're going to make the snippet be slightly grayed out. So we're going to do text gray 600 here. And that looks good. Um, what we, something else we want to do is, um, Currently, if you hover over this, you don't really see that you actually have one of these posts selected. So what we're going to do is we're going to underline the title when you hover over this A tag. And to do that, we're going to mark this as a group and then say, if you hover over the group, then underline. So if I now hover anywhere over this group, it underlines the title. And if I click on this, um, it sends me to the right page. I can go back. This all works and it's sorted. Um, old or newest to oldest. That was a lot of talking. I'm sorry. Uh, are there any questions about this? Uh, it does not look like it. Okay, let's take a break from coding. Um, so we've done a lot of coding. I've done a lot of talking. Let's actually deploy this. Um, I'm going to push up my index page here. And I'm now going to, going to go to GitHub and look at my repository for this. So this is the repository I'm pushing to. That's also private, not, not so important. Um, what I'll then do is I'll go to the Dino deploy dashboard, dash.dino.com. I'm already signed in. I already have a bunch of projects here. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll create, click on new project and I will select my user account and actually I'm going to need to add another repository. Um, so let's do, uh, what did I call this? Uh, fresh workshop chase nation. Yes. Let me give it access to this repository on GitHub. Um, so I select my organization and I do fresh workshop. JS Nation, select the branch I want to deploy, select the file I want to deploy. I want to deploy the main.ts file, that's the entry point. And I want to give it a name, uh, Fresh Workshop JS Nation. That sounds like a great name. And then I click on link. It's going to then download all my code, uh, clone my repository, package it all up, and it is now deployed. So if I go to um, the Fresh Workshop JS Nation .dev, dev link, you can see my page is deployed um, and it is not just deployed here in where I am in the Netherlands, but it is deployed everywhere. Um, if I open my inspect console here, uh, let's see, network panel and look at the response headers. I'm currently getting a response from Europe West 4, uh, which is in Amsterdam. Um, but if you all request this page and look at the response headers, it is going to be somewhere else, um, maybe in Asia or in the US. Um, yeah, so that was literally it. Um, this page is now deployed everywhere. I have uh, analytics for it, um, like request counts. I have um, logs. I'm, my, my application is actually generating any logs. Um, all the deployments, I can add environment variables, um, add a custom domain. Um, I can change the name if I want to. And the best part is, is that on GitHub, it um, deploys my page for um, each commit now. So um, every time I push up and do commit, it'll deploy it. It'll give it a unique preview URL. Uh, so this one is a fresh workshop JS nation with this long string and forever in, into eternity, um, this specific commit of this project will be available to this URL. Um, so even in three months time, if um, something drastically changes, but you realize that, I don't know, something broke in the last month and you want, you're trying to figure out like which commit did it break in. You can go through all of your old commits this way and um, really easily figure out when something broke uh, by, by using the preview URLs. Um, 
Any questions on Dino Lapoy? Or did, did it go too fast and people didn't see what happened? <laughs> um, Luca, I, yes. I would have one question, but regarding the, the page still, mm -hmm. um, the link we built in on the list, does this reload mm -hmm. the full page now, I assume? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, this is a full page transition. Um, so if I go to the network panel and I refresh, um, I click on the link. This does a full page transition. Um, so I get the response back here. And you can see that this is pretty much, you don't, oh, this is on localhost. Let me go to the deployed one and show you the timing there. Um, this pretty much happened so quickly that you can't even tell. This happens in is this 132 milliseconds. Um, the, the, if I reload this page, this page renders in 36 milliseconds. So this is like anything under 100 milliseconds, humans perceive as being instant. Um, so this is like, this navigation is so quick. Um, yeah, client-side rendering would just, would, would there's no, like, why would you client-side render this? This is much faster server-side rendered. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, um, and yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Will we have or uh, in the workshop? Will you cover routing or or if not, is um, there a router? Uh, yeah. So there's client side route. Fresh does not have client side routing. Um, Fresh does have um, interact like client interactive components, and we will get to that later on in in probably around half an hour or so. All right. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, but so it, just to yeah clear this up, everything we've seen so far is completely server-side rendered, and there's no JavaScript being served at all. Like you can see, this page is is the HTML page, and the CSS is embedded into the HTML, and there's no client-side JavaScript. Um, and this means that if I run this through web um, page speed insights here, uh, oh, why is this in German? Oh, right, I said my uh, my language to German, I remember now. <laughs> Give it a moment. Um, has a 100% performance score. Um, and this is like, as, as good as it can get um, on uh, Lighthouse. And you can actually see this not just with my page, but also other pages that are built for with um, fresh. Um, this is real user data here. Um, everything is completely green. Um, you pass all page, or like all core web vitals um, things by default um, because yeah, server side rendering is just really, really fast compared to client side rendering. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's now that we've deployed this to deploy, let's um, get back to coding and let's start with something slightly. Um, less complicated um, to get back into it, which is right now you can see that we're just rendering this as text here, as plain text, not as markdown yet, uh, which means that this looks kind of trash, right? Like this is not how I want my markdown um, thing to be to be rendered. Um, so to be able to render this as markdown, we first need to find some sort of tool which can help convert the markdown text to HTML um, that we can embed in our page. And there's actually a few libraries for Dino to do this. Uh, one of them is um, DinoLand X slash GFM, uh, which stands for GitHub flavored markdown. Um, and it, it, I can just import it. Let's just do that. And I will show you what it does. Uh, it, this is our post page. I can put this into my import map. I'm not gonna do that right now for time's sake, but um, yeah. So, uh, what I can do is I can do const HTML is equal to gfm dot render page dot, or uh, sorry post dot content, and this is going to render my markdown into HTML. And then instead of embedding the plain text string into my page, I can embed HTML instead. Um, and to embed HTML inside of Preact, you need to do like some slight gymnastics here. You have to do this, which just tells Preact, yes, I'm very sure I want to inject HTML in here because this might like this might inject, um, like if this is untrusted HTML that you're rendering, this might result in XSS and, and things like that. Um, if, if this is like user supplied HTML, you probably don't want to be doing this. Uh, but this HTML is provided by the 
developer by us, so it's probably safe. And GFM.render actually sanitizes the HTML as well. So it'll strip out any script tags or things like that that are in your Markdown. Uh, so if we look at this post now, um, you will see that uh, this definitely looks more rendered, but it still looks pretty terrible, right? Like there's, yes, this is technically a table, but um, without the right styling, this does not look like a very nice table. And, and same goes with, for this like H2 here, um, not a very nice table. So what we want to do here is we want to add some styling as well. And GFM actually ship, ships with a default style sheet for, um, for uh, the markdown as well, which we can also do this dangerously sit in HTML with. Very confusing because we're not actually going to be injecting HTML here, but CSS. Um, but yeah, so you can do this, and this will create a style tag on the page with, um, uh, yeah, with, with the CSS in it. And then we also need to create, give, give this element here a markdown body CSS tag. And you can now see it's nicely styled. And if I look at this, there's the style tag here, which has all of the um, CSS for styling markdown in it. Uh, so this works on my hello world post and on my hello world post, there's the thing that was previously um, with like the, the, the underscores on either side is now italic. Uh, this has the nice title um, and the table. And the title has this nice little button where when I click on it, it'll uh, give me an anchor URL to this page or the specific part of uh, the article. Uh, so that's Markdown rendering. Um, any questions on that or anything we've covered previously? Nope. Okay. So we're now at the point where um, all of our application is pretty much completely built now. The only thing that we're still missing is the time formatting. Um, so if you remember, if you go back to the reference page here, you will see that um, this renders the dates in the user selected locale and user can, users can switch the locale by going to the settings page and um, updating the locale here. So let's see, I want, I want to have, go back to my default locale, which is apparently German. Um, or if we go to Dutch and it'll render things in Dutch. The first step here is to be, to even, oh, uh, there we go, that's our code, um, to um, even render our dates to, uh, with a given locale. So right now we are just calling to locale date string um, and to locale date string um, does, yeah, it, it, it takes a locale argument, but we're not specifying it one. Um, so it'll just render with the default user agent locale, which on my system is English, um, which is what, or English uh, US, which is why this all renders in, or is it English UK? I don't know. It, it renders in some sort of English um, time format. Um, so let's change that. Let's use a the, the intel.date format. Um, built in. So we're going to create a date formatter with intel or new intel dot date time format. Um, and date time format is a built in in, in JavaScript. It's actually not that new, um, but it allows you to do like super advanced date type formatting. Um, like you can be get really, really um, creative with how you format the dates um, and get very precise in how exactly you want them to be formatted. For now, let's hard code the locale to be English UK and specify an options bag. Um, and we're just gonna say, we want this date style to be full. Um, and this date style full is just a preset that essentially, like you have all these options on date time format. For example, do you want to display dates? If so, do you want them to display as numeric or two digits? So like if, if you're day six of the month, do you want to display it as six or as 06? Um, or month, um, do you want to display month as the two digit date? as the numeric date as like Jan for January, or do you want it to like read out January in its full um, stuff like that. Date style full is like the longest date style you can have. And this is on the posts page. 
So on top of the, um, that is this, this uh, time up here, uh, it, it's fine if we have this one be really long because um, this, this, yeah, this is a whole post, right? You're only showing one day. Um, so we can have that be really long. And what we can do is we can take this formatter and say date time format dot format with the date instead of calling to the call date string. And if I refresh now, it will format this with the long date. Um, so yeah, that's really easy. If I want to use a different locale now, I can specify that here. So I want this to be in German. Um, it's going to be in German. And um, I can actually also specify multiple locales. So I could say like, I want English or I want German, and then it's going to pick whichever one in this list it supports. So if I specify one in the front here, which it doesn't support, like, I don't know, uh, xx dot yy like this it definitely does not support this because it's not a thing it'll just fall back to english i mean if i switch around the order here um it will fall back to german now because that's the second one for now let's hard code distinguish though uh, let's do the same date format thing for the index page I'm also just playing a date here um, let's once again do the date format and in, instead of doing a full date this time, let's do a short date, I think. And we're going to do the same thing where we do date format dot format post dot publish at. And you can see here that actually nothing has changed because the output happens to be the same, but um, yeah, it, it's formatting using this other date formatter now. This is a refactor we have done now, so we can specify a custom locale in a moment. Um, and commit this. And actually, just a quick note, I'm committing this, and you will see that um, if I go to my page here, uh, JS Nation, I'm very slow at typing. So by the time, yeah, this is already deployed. So this deploys really, really quickly here. Um, if I push it, it takes like five or six seconds for it to deploy. And not just deploy close to me, but deploy globally in like all of our regions. Um, okay, so the next thing, let's figure out what locale the user actually wants their page to be displayed in. Um, and we can start out by just looking at the accept languages header that the browser sends um, when it makes a, re a request. So if we go to the network panel again, and we look at this request that the browser sends, you can see that as part of the request headers, uh, where is it here, the request headers, it sends this accept language header, um, which contains a bunch of um, languages that the user um, ha like understands or, or supports um, and which one of them they prefer. Um, so for example, I have currently set up that I prefer German and um, after that is US and then British and then um, just plain English. And this, this queue here, that's like, how much do I prefer it? So if there's no queue, I prefer it the most and the lower the number, the less I prefer it. And if I go into my Chrome settings here, Chrome settings, go to the language settings again and change the order. Now let's move this to the top, for example. Um, and where's my local? Oh, that's the wrong one. And if I refresh, uh, you can see this is now a different order. And now German is the, the one I care least about. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, we could, so what we could do is we have this handler function where we get the request. Um, we could, in each handler function, um, do like request.headers, dot get accept language and parse that out. And that's, but that's kind of annoying because we have multiple pages and ideally we want to only write this code once and share it between all of our pages. So what we can do instead is we can use a middleware. Um, and to use a middleware in fresh, you call, you create this underscore middleware file anywhere in your route structure. And this middleware is at the root of your route structure, which means it is going to intercept all requests. So any request that comes into your application is going to be intercepted by this middleware. Um, and this middleware is actually very similar to the handlers in that it exports a function 
called handler. Um, and uh, this takes in a re request, which is a request, and it takes in a context. Um, and this time the context is a middleware, mi sorry, middleware, no, square can type, uh, middleware handler context, context, there we go. Uh, and we can import this from uh, fresh server. Um, and then what we can do here is, uh, for now, we'll do nothing. We'll just call uh, uh, context.next. Um, and what this will just do is it will call this function and then it'll immediately hand it off to the next middleware. And because there is no next middleware, it'll hand it off to uh, the route handler. So if we look at this uh, localhost, we'll see nothing has changed, right? But we can validate that this is actually being called. We could do like console.log request.url, for example. And you can now see that every time I refresh here, um, it'll intercept all of the requests that the browser is making. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see, what can we do here? Uh, we can, we, we now wanna parse out this accept languages header. Um, to do that, we're going to use a library called uh, accept language parser, it's on NPM. Um, but indeed, we can still import things from NPM by importing them from ESM.sh. So you can do ESM.sh um, accept language parser, oh, parser at, and we're going to do uh, 1.50. That's the latest version. Um, so we can call this parse function with the request uh, header called accept languages accept language. Um, and this parse function can take either a string or undefined, get return string or null. So we're going to turn the null into an undefined. Um, and then for now, let's just log out the langs. Console log langs. So we refresh this, you'll see it parses out the accept language header, and it uh, gives me the list of all of the um, supported locales that the user has. We now somehow need to pass this information from the middleware into our handlers and then ultimately into our intel.date time format, um, date time format objects. To do that, we use context state or, or middleware state. Um, so you might have seen this during the tab completions earlier. I think there's something called the context.state that I can set um, information on. And I will then be able to use this data inside of my handlers by also calling context.state here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a context state locales array. That's going to have all the locales in it. And then we're going to we're going to iterate over all of the locales um, in the languages array here for lang of langs. Uh, create a new locale which is lang.code. Uh, so lang.code is this first part. And if there's a region, so if there is a region in this locale, we can do locale plus equals dash lang.region. Uh, so this means that for, for this code, for example, here, um, it'll be en dash gb. Um, for this one, which does not have a region, it'll be en. With, with nothing after there. And this same here, so DE with nothing after it. Um, and then we can uh, append the locales to our locales array. Um, context push locales, right? Yes, okay. And we're gonna deal with this type error in just a second here. Um, but one thing we wanna do first is if the user has not actually specified an accept languages header, which is like all browsers specify this, but let's say the user makes a request using curl or something, we don't want it to break. So what we're gonna do is if there are no locales specified, so if context.locales.length is equal to zero, then we can context state locales.push en. So it'll just default to English if there's no locales. Let's get rid of this type error. Um, so right now you can see that context.state is um, this like record string unknown. 
type. Let's change that. Let's change it to be a concrete type. Um, so just like we did with the handlers earlier, where we could explicitly specify what type the uh, render data is, we can do the same with middlewares. Um, so we're going to create a little uh, file here called state.ts, just so we have somewhere to put this um, definition of state, because we're going to share it across multiple files. Um, we're going to have the state contain the array of locales as strings. Um, and if we now specify this, oh, uh, state, and we import that, then you will see all the type errors go away and state is, is typed to be a state here. Um, and we can actually do the same for our handlers now. So we can do state as the second argument to handlers, let's import that. Um, and now if we call context, oh, context.state here, we'll have locales that will have the right type. So uh, we want to pass the locales from our handler into our page now. So we can use it in the state time format. Um, to do this, we're going to have to pass it through the render data again. Um, so the render data currently is just the post but we want it to be the post and the locale data. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a little wrapper type called uh, data, which is going to have, which is going to extend state, extends state. And it also has a post field on it. And we're going to use that as the type for our page props and handler data. Um, and then we can do context.state, spread that into this object and add the post and here, we can now do post and locales to get the post and the locales from the page data. We can now put these locales into into the date time format. And if we go to the page now, and well, which one is this? This is the blog page. Um, this is currently UK rendering. Um, if I switch this to be German at the top and refresh, it says it in German. Okay, so it works. So we go through the middleware. Let me recap what we're doing. Go through the middleware, get the accept language header, we parse it. We then build the list of all the locales that the user supports. If they don't support any locales, we just default to English. And go to the next context or the next um, handler, which is the handler of the route. In here, uh, we get the blog post as we saw earlier. We then call the render function with the state, the items in the state. So that is the locales plus the blog post. We then extract the blog post and the locales out of the data in the uh, uh, page function. We put that into the intel.datetime format. We then use the intel.datetime format to format the publish at date. And then that gets displayed on the page. And that was a very long session. And I hope you have questions so I can stop talking about code for like five minutes. <laughs> I hope that made any sense, by the way. If it didn't, please ask. So it made a lot of sense, in my opinion. I think that uh, even the middle wells can be composable, like you can pu publish it to NPM, right? Or, or not to NPM and uh, reuse this logic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, if you want, if you would want to have, for example, so somebody asked me the other day how you would write, like, I don't know if any of you have used next auth, that's like an auth framework for Next.js, how you would build that for Dino. Um, and you would essentially do this you'd create a middleware, um, handle like this, which like intercepts all the requests, extracts out the authorization tokens, does all that. Um, and then, um, yeah, like, uh passes the yeah and then like adds the authorization information into the context state um and so then users can use that in the handlers to like, authorize that a user has has access to something yeah um i have a question uh you mentioned mm -hmm. that uh, we can also import things uh from npm using esm that is yeah is there any restriction on that uh or can we pretty much expect any modules to work. Yeah, so the 
easy way. Okay, so first of all, the, the first thing to say is anything which is on NPM and runs in a browser is going to pretty much work in Dino as well. Um, like if if as long if you're not importing any like node specific modules, like the FS module, for example, it is definitely going to work. Dino does shim out, or ESM Node SH does shim out the FS module, for example, in Node.js, or the process, like the child process module, or the uh, you know, like a bunch of other things. If you input those things, there's a higher chance it won't work than if it doesn't import them at all, but it probably will still work. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it really depends on the module itself. Like if you have a module which uses um, nodes, native, native, um, what is it called? Native libraries API, an API, um, or uses FFI or anything like that. That's not going to work because Dino does not support nodes like, um, uh, native modules system. Um, but anything which uses just like the FS module or the child process module or the node HTTP module, anything like that, that'll just work. Um, so it usually it's just try it out and it probably will work. Um, and if it doesn't, then it doesn't, but in most cases it'll work. Yeah. So it's so really only things which are like very, very node specific on NPM will not work. So what is the process of porting it to, to Dino? Let's say that I want to port the library to Dino. Yeah, so um, if you have a, um, okay, so, Again, this really depends on what kind of library it is. So if it's a library, which is like purely computational, it does nothing other than take some input and return some output. Porting probably involves like deleting a couple files, like deleting the package.json file and like deleting your prettier config and deleting your like just config because that's all built into Dino. Um, but you probably don't need to do any of that because you can just import the package via ESM Redis stage. If you have a package which really relies on node features and you want to port that, then that means you have to go through your source code and rewrite like the, the places where you import from the FS module, change that to use like dino.open or dino.read file or like dino's FS stuff. Um, yeah, so that's that's something you have to do. But we actually provide you with some tooling called DNT. Um, I actually gave another workshop um, at, oh, I don't remember where, I think at Node Congress. No, maybe not at Node Congress. I think it was at Node Congress um, where I demonstrate how this works. Um, so DNT, let's, uh, DNT, that's this one. Uh, this allows you to take a library that you wrote for Dino and it will transpile it into something that you can publish to NPM. So you can like write, if you have a library, can write it for Dino first and then sort of like transpile it for um, NPM for, so your node users can still use it, but you get all the benefits of using Dino. Um, so there's some ways of doing this, um, but uh, it's, if I go into like all the details, this workshop is going to explode. Like let's, like if we have time at the end, let's cover it then. And otherwise um, maybe hit me up on Discord after the fact and we can chat about it there. But yeah, it's possible. Um, it just really depends on what kind of library it is, what exactly you need to do. Yeah, I have um, a question about deploying Dino to mm -hmm. other places like Dino deploy, like AWS or Google. Yeah. Uh, how hard it is, like what would you recommend? Are there any like, recipes already? Yeah, so um, there's a bunch of places you can de deploy Dino other than Dino deploy. Um, so Dino deploy obviously is really easy because it's built for deploying Dino code. But um, fly.io is another one um, which it's really easy to to deploy um, Dino to. I think they have a yeah here uh, example. If you're deploying to AWS, um, there's uh, uh, begin.com. Um, they have some documentation of how to deploy to uh, AWS. Um, let's see if we can find that real quick. No, this page is taking too long to load. <laughs> okay, I can't find it right now, but there's a, there's, you can deploy to AWS as well. You can deploy to GCP using like Cloud Run and Dino in a Docker container. Uh, we publish official um, Docker images. If you go to github.com slash Dino land slash Dino Docker. Um, yeah, we have official Docker images, which are updated um, 
like uh, at the same time we update Dino itself, um, you can use those to build like a Docker image to deploy anywhere. Um, there is a AWS Lambda um, runtime for Dino as well. It's not an official one yet, but it's maintained by, right, let me see if I can find it, Dino Lambda. Uh, let's see, is this the one? I think this is the one. Yeah, so this is like a Dino, um, like deploying to, to Lambda. Um, it's possible. Um, you can deploy to Vercel. You can deploy to Netlify using Netlify edge functions. You can deploy to Superbase using Superbase edge functions. Um, you can deploy to Azure's cloud functions. Uh, you can, yeah, you can deploy to anywhere that supports Docker containers. So like Kubernetes, if you want to, uh, you can just run it on a VM. Uh, yeah, you can pretty much deploy anywhere. <laughs> Amazing, thanks. I have a question about the version of the uh, STD um, mm -hmm. namespace uh, versus the version of uh, Dino itself. Uh, yeah. Is there a compatibility that we, we should be aware of? Yeah, so Dino is past 1.0, which means that it, it like Dino's APIs are completely stable. Um, as in, we only ever add things. We never remove anything from the Dino um, API. For SCD, it is not yet at 1.0. You can see there is like, it, it's still pre 1.0. So SCD is technically still unstable, which means that we sometimes remove things, move them around um, to get it ready to go to 1.0. Um, but we always publish Dino SCD and Dino at the same time, like a, a, at the same, like on the same day when we cut Dino, we also cut Dino SCD, which means there's always a Dino SCD release which has been tested with the latest version of Dino. Um, so the latest version of Dino STD always works, like 100% definitely works with the latest version of Dino. But a, D a Dino STD version from like 10 weeks ago will most likely also work with the latest version of Dino. Because Dino has no breaking API changes, um, like even a version from Dino or a version of STD from a year ago will still work with the current version of um, do you know what you do need to be aware of if you're updating STD? So an STD version from 10 weeks ago to an STD version from today, you may have to look through the change log to see if there's anything um, in the API that has changed in one of the APIs that you're using. Um, but yeah, it's pretty rare. We, we, we usually don't change things in STD, even though it's not stable yet. We don't change things in, in the parts that people like very actively use. Um, and we try to be very careful about it. Like we deprecate things first. And then um, like it'll show up in your editor that it's deprecated um, and then you can like update in your own time. And there's nothing that requires you to update to a newer version of SCD. Like using a version of SCD from a year ago, it's probably fine. Um, like it's not the end of the world. And we are working towards ultimately having SCD go stable. And when it goes stable, it will be versioned the same version as Dino. So if like Dino 1.24 is released, we'll have STD 1.24 released on the same day. But yeah, currently they're still out of out of sync, even though they are published on the same day. Okay, are there any other questions or? You want to hear me blab about code again? <laughs> okay, I guess we're continuing with um, talking about code. So uh, we are now using the default language version that the user selected via their browser. Uh, but in the reference application, you can select your own version um, on the settings page. Uh, so on the settings page, it shows your current locale and you can update the locale using this field here. Um, we also want to support this now. So what we're going to do is first thing we're going to do is just add a new route for the settings page. Um, so let's add settings.tsx here. And um, am I just going to copy all of this? No, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm just going to do this manually. Um, export default function settings page and let's copy this. Um, I 
is import the TW and add the title. And you can see that if I go to localhost slash settings, this page now exists. And there's nothing on it yet, but it's there. Um, then let's add the little thing that says what locale you're currently using. Um, to do that, we're going to need a handler again um, because we need to show uh, because we need to get the locales from the state and pass it into the the, the page props. Uh, so we're going to do a handler for the get request again oh. for the get request, and it is going to take the request and the context, and it is going to do context return context dot render context dot state, and let's import handlers from for server.ts and import state from util state.ts. And I can now get my props from my page props. Again, have the argument be state. And I can now get my locale. Uh, locales props.data. And I can then do p your current locale is uh, locales zero. And if I look at this, it shows my current locale. Let's add a margin here. Okay, so this is uh, pretty trivial. Um, this is just another like read only page, right? There's no interaction that's happening here. You're just retrieving data from the server. It's rendering it and it's being displayed to you. Um, add read only settings page. What we want to be able to do is we want to let the user input a locale um, and submit that and then send it to the server, save it on the server. Um, and then the next time the user makes a request, we want to retrieve that locale and use that instead of the one that's specified in the accept languages header. To do that, we're going to use cookies. Um, so we're going to have an input field, which when you enter something into the input field and hit save, it will set a cookie um, where I can actually show you this. It will set a cookie, yes, um, where the value is. Um, this one is irrelevant, we can remove that, um, where the value is the locale that you set. And um, we can then, inside of our middleware, extract this cookie, um, see what the value is. And if there is a cookie set with a value, we will use that instead of the accept language header. So uh, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a form on the server, or sorry, on the, uh, um, we're going to create a form that the user can use uh, here, that the user can input things into, uh, which is going to have a label. It's going to have an input field, name, locale, ID, locale. Um, it's going to have a button to submit things. It's going to say save. Um, and this is this looks like this right now. Uh, let's add some styling to make this look less terrible. Let's do a border on this and do a uh, padding, some more padding. That looks much better. Um, let's make this a uh, space x2. So there's space in between all the things. Um, let's make this button a little nicer. So we're going to have the button also have some padding. Um, we're going to do a background blue. Um, it's going to be 500. By default, if you hover over it, it becomes a little darker. And if it's disabled, it becomes a little lighter. Um, we want to change the text color to white. And let's change the font to medium. And 
And yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Uh, let's change this to be uh, font bold. Actually, I don't like that. Let's change that to just be a little bigger. Text XL maybe. I uh, actually don't like that either. Let's just keep it the way it was. Okay, so we have a form now. Uh, you can enter things into this form, and if you hit enter, it will say error 405. Um, and error 405 means there, this method is unsupported. So this just sent a post request to the server when I um, when I navigated or when I when I pressed save. Um, but we don't actually have a handler set up for a post request. So we're going to do that. We're going to set up a handler for post requests. Uh, we take in the request, we take in the context. Uh, we actually don't need the context. Um, we're just going to take in the request. We're then going to, um, this was a form that was submitted. So we can call data. This is going to parse the form data out of the request and return it to us as a form data object. Uh, we can then call, let's see, we can get the locale out of the form. So we can do form.get locale. Um, the name of the input was locale. So the form element is also going to be called locale. Uh, let's do some input validation. So if type of locale is equal to string, then let's um, set a cookie. So uh, to set a cookie, we can import some utilities from the DO standard library again. There's a function called set cookie in std http cookie.ts. And let's actually look in that in the docs real quick. http cookie.ts. Um, yeah, called set cookie. And this takes the headers as the first argument that we're trying to set the cookie on. And so this is the response headers and the cookie itself. And the cookie is has a name, has a value, and a bunch of other options, which we don't particularly care about right now. Uh, so to do this, we first need to create a headers object, uh, new headers. We can then call uh, set cookie headers uh, name locale value locale uh, we don't need to let's let's not worry about like expiry actually let's set up an expiration date i okay uh, so it's going to be uh that's one hour that's 24 hours that's a year so this uh, cookie is not going to be set for a year and then let's return a response um which has going to have no body it's going to be status 303, which is a redirect. Um, it's going to have the headers. And actually, redirect headers also, or redirect uh, ex, um, responses with redirect status codes also need to have a location header, uh, which is where you're redirecting them to. Uh, so we're just going to redirect these or back to the settings page when they hit submit. So this is going to turn the post request where we set the cookie back into a get request where they just get the settings page again. So if I now call, now call uh, let's see, NL, uh, you see nothing changed because we're not taking the header into account yet for this display. But if I go to my application panel and look at my cookies and I get rid of all of this garbage here, which is, not relevant um, and change the header value here or change the the, loca the locale value. Um, you can see the header or the cookie changes. So that's part one of this. Part two is that we actually need to parse out this header in the middleware. So um, before we parse out the accept language header, let's uh, import these cookie utilities here as well. Uh, so let's uh, get cookies. So const cookies is equal to get cookies with request headers. So cookies are sent on the request headers from the client. And if we want to change them, we have to set them on the response headers. Um, we can do cookies, um, what did I call it, locale. 
if cookies.locale, then we do context.state.locales.push cookies.locale. Okay, that was pretty easy. Um, and now you actually have seen it already. If I change this here, it updates my current locale. And if I go to the home page now, it reflects this correctly on the settings or the, the settings that I changed are being correctly reflected on the posts. Um, if I change this to like Polish and look at this, you will see it now says it's in Polish. Very nice. If I just press enter, it'll reset back to whatever my default except languages um, locale is because it'll set the cookie header to the empty string. Uh, the empty string does not pass this if statement, so it is not pushed onto the locale array. Okay, uh, so that is now how to do post requests and form um, form handling in, in Fresh using Dino. Um, are there any questions about this? Just so far, um, we're gonna, yeah, there's, there's more to do still. Okay, that does not sound like it. Um, that is the wrong project again. Um, okay, if there's no questions, that's great. Um, let's add some padding to the top of this and commit that. Okay, so now we're gonna get into something interesting again. Um, not to say the other stuff wasn't interesting, but this is especially interesting, um, which is that everything we've done so far has been server side interaction only, right? Like it's always you uh, do something on the server, like you render the page, it displays that on the client, the client clicks something on the button or on, on the client that sends a request to the server, updates something on the server, sends back some data to the client. Uh, for some things, this is uh, not really necessary. Like something you, something you might wanna do is when you type a locale into this field here, um, why doesn't it like live show you what the name of this locale is or uh, like a preview of the locale? Right now, if I wanna preview what a lo given locale would look like, like enter it, press save, to then navigate back to the index page or, or this page and like refresh and check what it looks like and then navigate back and if I don't like it, very annoying. Um, I just want it to like show up here and ideally without any network requests, just on the client. So this is a great use case for some client interactivity. Um, and Fresh supports client interactivity, but it does it a lot different to a lot of other frameworks. So if you've ever used Next.js before, um, then you will know that you can essentially write like on, or uh, you, you can essentially put like um, state manipulation things or like use state and, and on click handlers and all that kind of stuff anywhere in your entire um, website. And what Next.js will do is it will take the entirety of your website, like the entire rendering code that is run on the server, it'll ship it to the client. This is like 70 or 80 or 100 kilobytes of JavaScript, and it will re-render your entire page on the client. So for example, for the blog page um, where we show um, blog entries, it will um, take the entire markdown library that is used to take the, the markdown or to, to, to do the markdown rendering and it will uh, ship that entire thing to the client even though the rendering already happened on the server it'll re-render it on the client again um, but like the user won't really notice that anything happened because it'll hopefully give the same output on both the server and the client so it's it's not really useful to do this right like why why are you rendering um, everything on the client again even though it's not necessary ideally you only want to be rendering things on the client which actually makes sense to render on the client. Um, to do this, Fresh uses a concept called islands. Um, and islands are, um, yeah, how do I best explain islands? Um, islands, I, I, um, mm -hmm. actually, okay, I have a nice, nice way of putting this. Okay, islands are islands of interactivity in a sea of static content. So you have static content, and then part of your application is like a little island that is interactive. And that island has all of its rendering code shipped to the client, 
and is able to do like anything that a regular Preact component can do on the client, for example. Um, and this coin, this term was actually coined by um, um, uh, Jason um, from the Preact team. Um, let's actually pull up the blog post, Jason format. Uh, do we have, yes, this one here. Um, this actually is a really nice uh, example. Um, so for example, you can have your HTML page here, which part of this, like the header, for example, you wanna have the header be interactive because it's like a pop-up or something. You wanna have the sidebar be interactive because it has like a newsletter or sign-up form in it. And you wanna have the image carousel be interactive because there's buttons that you click on. But um, the uh, content, so for example, the blog post itself does not need to be interactive, right? Like the blog post is static content. You can render that on the server. There's no need to re-render that on the client. Um, so that can be static. And then all of your interactive components that actually do need to be interactive can be little islands, which only contain the code that actually they require to uh, render on the client. Fresh makes this really easy to do um, by creating, by having this folder called islands. Um, and anything inside of the islands folder, any component you put in there, is just a regular Preact component, but that component will be rehydrated on the client, which means that um, that component will have full client interactivity on the client. So if I have a component which is called, I don't know, the locale selector, selector.tsx, and I export um, this locale selector function, and actually I need to import Preact. Um, and I return Let's see, let's, let's put this entire form here into the call selector. Um, I can get the locale selector, import it from the islands directory. And so far this looked like nothing has changed, right? This is just, we've moved this code from being directly inlined into the page to being in a separate file. But by putting it into the separate file inside the islands directory, we've actually done something pretty special, which is that if we look at the inspect panel here, look at the network panel, do a refresh, you'll see that we're loading this island locale selector.js file. And if we look at this and pretty format it, um, let's see if we can actually view what's going on here. Uh, can we? Yes. So this is so this is that form um, that like this form here, the cal selector component. Uh, but the JSX is transpiled out. Um, so you can see like this is the rendering code we need to render this form on the client. Um, yeah, but it doesn't contain, for example, the word settings anywhere in the bundle because this is only server side rendered. The only thing that is client side rendered is this form itself here. That means that we can now do client interactivity on this component. Um, that means that uh, we can do things like, actually, let me make this a little easier. We can do, we can put an on-click event onto this button. That is when you click on it, it opens an alert. And I save this and it opens an alert. And this is like client interactive, right? Which means if I do this, this JavaScript that um, opened this alert happened on the client, not on the server. Um, if I do this, if I try to do this anywhere else, um, like if I want to put this on click on my settings button up here or on my settings set, this does not work because this is not a um, island. This is not this server side rendered only, not a client component. This means that we can now do things like use use state. Um, so we can do, uh, let's do this, use state preact hooks const locale set locale. Uh, where we can do things like um, con control the, this input um, using the state hook. Uh, so we'll set the value to, uh, this locale and whenever you input anything, you um, update, oh, 
uh, you update the state. Um, so set state is equal to e dot current target dot value. Um, and you can see this does nothing yet, or nothing observable at least. But what we could do is we could, for example, render out the locale here. Um, and what this will do is if I type something in here, it will render it out right next to there um, as I'm typing without making a request to the server. So this is all in the client, nothing happening on the server. There's no network traffic. Um, and this means we can do things like um, show the localized name of the locale that the user typed. So for example, let's say the user types um, EN in here, we want to show English as the locale. We can do this using another INTL API, an Intel API called intel.locale. Um, I did not think this through with my names of variables, but that's fine. Um, and actually, we only want to do this if locale is not empty. So what we're going to do is say, if locale exists, then set this to locale. Otherwise, it'll be undefined or an empty string, actually. Uh, mm, let's do this differently. Let's do it like this. Okay, so if locale is defined, it'll get the intel.locale value for it. Otherwise, it'll be null. Um, what we can then do is we can create a an intel. Dot, um, what is it? Display names formatter, um, which is going to have its locale be set to English and its type be set to language. And we're going to find that up here. And we can then do um, if locale exists, we can print out locale format of loc lock dot language. So what this will do is if I type in en, if I type in en, okay, in theory, if I type in, it's not working. <laughs> uh, why it's not working? Incorrect local denial. That's right. Can you say that again? Incorrect local uh, information provided. Ah, yes. Right. Errors. Um, oh, because, okay. Right. Okay. I, I know why. So if I, so this will actually happen if I just enter E, for example, E is not a valid locale. So it'll try to do this locale format that of with the language and it'll fail because E is, um, like it doesn't know what the what the uh, formatted version of the e locale is because it doesn't exist. Uh, so what we can do instead is we can do we can do a try catch. Um, we can do let um, let's see. So language is a string, and if locale exists, we will we can so simplify this. I completely didn't realize. Um, let's get rid of this. Okay. If locale exists, we create our intel.locale. Then we try language, e language equals locale format dot, um, of lock dot language. We then catch this if it fails and just completely ignore it here. Um, Uh, oh, actually, this probably needs to be moved in here. Um, and apparently, this can be string undefined, right? And default is undefined. And then we can say if locale exists, we just print out locale, or we just print out the language. There we go. There we go. Okay. Much better. Let's put this into a P so it's underneath. And so if I type in EN, it'll print out English. If I print in JA, it says Japanese. If I uh, do PL, it'll be Polish, so on and so forth. Okay, very nice. Um, let's, uh, yeah, are there any questions about this so far? I've been talking for a while.
No questions about client interactivity and islands. Uh, I've heard that people refer to it as partial iteration. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. This concept, yeah, which is, everything is static, uh, and you create your islands of JavaScript. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty nice. Yeah, exactly. Partial iteration. Yeah, that's uh, that's is pretty much same same concept of components. Yeah. It's been getting more popular recently. Mm -hmm. When we render this uh, on the server side, uh, what's going to be sent as the this component that's an, that's not an island? Um, Is it going it to be will, an empty thing? No, it'll actually render the component on the server as well. So if I um, look at this and Okay, this is not very nicely formatted, is it? Uh, hmm. How am I going to demonstrate this? Uh, well, I guess I could just scroll through here a little. You can actually see that somewhere over here, this is the server side render. And on the server side render, this is where the island starts. Um, the form is also rendered on the server. And it goes up to here. And then on the client, everything from this comment up to this comment here it's replaced with the client interactive version of the island um, if you don't want this you can also for example say um, if i'm not is browse if not is browser yeah, is browser is something you can import from fresh runtime uh, fresh runtime um, if you're in a browser you can return uh, like an empty div. And then what you will see happens is um, it apparently says empty and then it says the form. Okay, I don't know. Something's broken here. But uh, yeah, you can you can do like conditional rendering from only on the client or only on the server, um, depending on um, yeah, just like how you want um, using things like detecting if you're in the browser or on the server. Does that answer your question? Yep. Thanks. Great. Uh, any other questions? Uh, does not look like it. Cool. Um, then let's add one more thing, which is the on the reference page. Um, we have when we enter something in here. It'll give you a sample of the date or of the time, not just the language name. Let's do the same thing. Um, so we're gonna set, uh, change this to be a description list. Oh, sorry, a DL, not a D, yeah. Um, and then we're gonna have a DD is the uh, name. So that would be a language and the DT, I think this is the book that we ran. I never remember. I think it's DLDDDT. Probably. Um, and then let's do the other one, which was time sample. And we're going to set this to be time sample. Uh, and to do this time sample, we're going to create a new date, which is what we're going to use to. Uh, show the, the the time sample, um, and we're going to create another let time sample, and if time sample is equal to, um, we need to create a date time formatter. Blue until dot date time format locale, with the options being date style full. We can do date fmt dot format with the date and pass that here. And if we now look at the page, it will show German and it is not showing the time sample. Why is it not showing the time sample? Oh. You mean you need to prov you provide it okay? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't have this in quotes here. Um, that was the problem. OK, so that works now. Uh, let's quickly do some styling on this to make it look less terrible and actually wrap this in 
uh, a thing to make it only show up if the language and time sample actually exists. So if it exists, it'll show it. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, yeah, so that works. Um, let's uh, make the styling a little nicer font bold. Cool, and that works. And let's add uh, some padding on here as well. Okay, so we now have a client interactive component, um, which does things on the client. If I press the save button, it does things on the server. Um, it persists state on the server here um, that is then accessed later when I render other pages. Um, this can be deployed globally. Um, uh, time sample very quickly uh, using Dino deploy or to any number of other providers um, using a Docker container or a VM or something like that. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the entire reference page or reference app um, rebuilt now, I think. I hope I didn't miss anything, um, which means we can now go into the extra stuff that I didn't think we'd get to because I thought this was already going to be too much. <laughs> um, so do people, first of all, have any questions about the entire thing, about the entire process? Um, questions that you thought like might not fit in very well in some other places? No questions. Okay, that is... Cool. Um, let's do some other things then. I'll, I'll demonstrate some more of what uh, Dino is capable of. So I have previously shown off the test framework and the formatter. Dino also has a built-in linter. Uh, this linter is like ESLint or anything similar um, like that. If I put some, some invalid code in here, uh, which is like syntactically valid, but logically not correct. For example, um, if true, Right, like, why would you ever write this? You know, lint is going to lint this and say, uh, you cannot have constant expressions in your if statements because what's the point? Or you cannot have an, an empty if statement because what's the point? Um, like, this will also show up in VS Code through the Dino uh, language server integration. Um, yeah, uh, something else which I have not really, which we've used, I've not showed you what it does though, is Dino task. So Dino task is very similar to um, like NPM run. Um, you have this Dino.json file, which is like an optional configuration file, which lets you define tasks and um, like default to which import map you want to use if you want to use an import map. Um, also lets you configure things like formatting options and linting options. You probably shouldn't though, just stick with the defaults. Um, yeah, so like I can have a task here, which is my start task, uh, which, um, like, yeah, so Dino task start is just the same as running this command. Um, let's see what other Dino things that did not cover. Can, can I ask a question uh, about uh, the related mm -hmm. to the import map? So I've seen it every map, time, yeah. it's not strictly related to the import map, but every time that you this VS Code extension, you auto imported stuff, you needed to change it to be the LS, LS. Wouldn't it be super nice if it was just automatically read it from the uh, input map? Yes. And this is this is something that should be contributed to the extension? Um, so yes, I agree this would be fantastic. Um, we are actually, there's an open issue about it. Um, and but the, the person who was going to work on it is currently on vacation. So he'll be back, I think, end of this week. And then we'll ho hopefully have it like in a couple of weeks here. Um, but I agree that would be really, really nice. And the other thing about where one would contribute this. So Dino consists, um, like the editor integrations consists of multiple parts. So it's one, the extension for like VS Code that's written in JavaScript and, or in TypeScript actually. Um, but it really uses the Dino LSP under the hood, um, the language server. And Dino LSP is like, um, 
it, it essentially does all of like the editor completions things that you've seen and the linting and formatting integration, everything like that is contained within the Dino LSP. This is written in Rust and is part of the Dino binary. And it allows us to reuse the same code for all of our editor extensions. So it, the Vim extension and the Nano, or I don't know if there's Nano extension, but like Vim and Emacs and VS Code and IntelliJ. There's probably Visual Studio extension. IntelliJ, exactly. Yeah, they, they yeah. all use the same Dino LSP. Um, yeah, it makes that. total sense. Um, actually, I can another cool thing that I didn't actually demonstrate, but also related to imports, which is super cool, is um, you can actually we we support auto completions of remote URL imports for certain registries. So, for example, if you want to import something from Dinoland, um, I can like do slash here, and it'll ask me if I want to import from SCD or from slash X. Let's say if I want to import from slash X. It'll give me all of the um, things on on you know STD here um, with the amount of GitHub stars they have and the name and like the description and I can actually search here as well. For example, I want to import fresh has like two and a half thousand stars. I'll click on here um, to be sent to you know, land X. Uh, I can uh, press slash again and it'll auto complete all of the things inside of the directory here that are and like code files that you could import. Totally dynamically, like it does request what you type. Oh, this mm -hmm. is so super yeah. impressive, the experience. Yeah, this is it's it's really, really great. And like it filters out things like I don't know, you probably don't want to like have underscore test files complete here, right? Um so like it filters those out and um it like like you can do this and then I don't know important stuff from here it's 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 pretty cool um you can like even click on let's see so i want to import uh let's let's import something else like oak as a middleware framework for dino um i can hover over this click on docs and then i'll be sent to doc dino land which um, is like an automatic documentation generator for for any module um, on the internet which uses ecmascript module syntax um, and it'll like automatically generate all this documentation based only from the JS doc comments in your source code. Um, and you can actually do this with, with yeah, any URL, I just enter URL in here and it'll like document it. For example, if I want to get the documentation for Preact, click on it and the, the Preact types actually don't have any nice type comments. So this is not very nice documentation, but um, you get the point. Yeah, and this is actually the same documentation we use for our Dino built-ins as well. So this is like all of this stuff built into Dino. And this this is like very extensive documentation, right? Um, wow, this scrolls a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> um, yeah. And there's some other cool things. Like, for example, I imported Oak here without a specific version. Um, it'll give me a warning here that I should really be importing a specific version. And it'll even give me a quick fix. So if I press command dot, It'll say update specify to redirect to specify, and if I do that, it'll update to the latest version. So yeah, there's a bunch of really cool DX stuff built into the LSP, and also Dino Doc, by the way, also supported on the command line. So if you want to like Dino Doc, uh, I don't know, util slash post dot ts, um, it'll like give me the documentation, and if I would actually write some documentation here. Uh, let's see. Lists all posts in the data directory and run Dino doc again. It will um, pull this out and show it here. It, it seems yeah. like influenced by uh, Cargo, right? Cargo doc, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like yeah, it's actually, yeah, we, we, we've taken a lot of inspiration from other modern languages like Rust and Go. Um, like the, the built-in formatting in like Dino FMT is very much inspired by Go in the sense that there's very little configuration options. We want everyone to use the same formatting configuration. Like there's this saying in the Go ecosystem where like Go FMT is nobody's favorite um, but it's but it's everyone's favorite because it makes everything look the same everywhere. It's really easy to get started with a new project because like the code looks exactly how you expect it to look because everybody uses the same formatter. Even if you might not agree about how it like 
does like a tab indent somewhere or like how it line breaks something. Um, but just because it uses the same formatting for everywhere, um, I think that's what yeah. makes it so nice. To uh, use. I think that because of Prithia, uh, the JavaScript world is understanding this concept more and more. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I definitely agree. I agree. And like same goes for linting as well, right? Like lint, all of the rules are mostly inspired by ESLint. There's this lint.dinoland website, which shows all the rules. Um, this page is very much inspired by um, Rust's um, uh, Clippy page. Let's see if we can find it. Clippy Rust. Oh, this is the one here. By this page where you can like um, see all the rules um, and we have something very similar here. All the rules. Um, yeah. Um, look up if, uh, if I want to uh, create a CLI um, application, can I still use Dino? Yeah, definitely. So do you know you can use for, I, I've, I've been mostly showing it for front end stuff here, but um, I actually think that Dino works probably like 50% 50, 50 better for for like CLI applications than it does for front end. Like it really, it's really fantastic for front end, but it is like, a, a, like, like very, very, very fantastic <laughs> for CLI applications. Um, because like on, on CLI, you have issues with like dependency management and like the same issues that you have with NPM you can also get into with, you know, with like duplicate transitive dependencies or whatever. But with CLI, it's like, it's fantastic. Um, there's there's a bunch of really cool frameworks for like CLI things in Fordino as well. For example, um, Cliffy is one of them. Um, if you've ever used Clap in Rust, um, it's like a, uh, a framework for um, CLI applications, which makes it really easy to create um, like nice CLI tooling, which like has automatic um, like uh, like it automatically generates um, completions for, for for all the editor for all of the shells and stuff like that. Um, yeah, Cliffy is a really really awesome uh, like CLI framework that you can use. So regarding the question about CLIs, I know that it depends, mm -hmm. but uh, for your next CLI, would you use Dino or Rust? It depends. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, so it yeah it, it really depends on what i'm trying to do right if i'm trying to write something which is extensible to the user and like needs to need i need to be able to change it very quickly um i will i would use dino for sure um but if it's like like a cli can be many things right like if i'm writing a cli which is like a mm, tool for deploying some code to aws for example i would write that in dino but if i'm writing a mm, like a JavaScript runtime, right? I don't want to write a JavaScript runtime in JavaScript. That is not going to be fast enough. So I would write that in Rust. Um, but yeah, for pretty much anything which isn't like it is where it is not the number one important priority that it is the fastest thing on the planet, I would use Dino. Yeah. But Rust is also really awesome. And you can actually use Dino or Rust inside of Dino very well using WebAssembly. Um, like Dino has awesome support for WebAssembly. And you can compile Rust to WebAssembly very easily. And we actually make a lot of use of in that. For example, like this doc.dinoland website, the, the, the thing that pulls out the documentation out of your JavaScript files, it's written in Rust and it's compiled to WebAssembly. And then, but this website runs on Dino Deploy. So um, it's like there's a WebAssembly thing on Dino Deploy, which parses out your, your, uh, source code as it comes in um, and then uses JavaScript to render out the page using JSX. So there's like some really nice synergies that you can get there. Um, that raises another question. Is is this thingy uh, running on WebAssembly uh, written in Rust and then deployed using the Rust code? Or is it the first compiled to WebAssembly and then deployed as WebAssembly too? Deploy. You mean do you know doc specific like Dr. Dinoland specifically or yeah. or oh, okay yeah so Dr. Dinoland um I'll just, I'll just pull it up and show you um it's all open source uh let's see is the website yes there we go okay so the entry point is a TypeScript file and this TypeScript is 
running inside of V8 um, as is, but it calls into a, uh, let's see here, it imports um, this Dino doc crate or Dino doc library, um, which then in turn imports some WebAssembly. So this is like JavaScript importing WebAssembly. Um, it is not like WebAssembly, WebAssembly like running JavaScript inside of a, uh, I, like inside of an engine inside of WebAssembly or something like that. Like it's JavaScript driving the WebAssembly, not the other way around. I don't know if that was the question you asked. Uh, no, my question was, um, let's say I want to have a collaboration between Rust and TypeScript. Can I mm -hmm. uh, just rely on uh, Dino Deploy to make everything work or do I have to oh, okay. it as a separate package like what you did? Uh, sorry, I, I misunderstood the question. Um, no, you have to, so you have to compile the Rust WebAssembly yourself. Um, so so this module here, um, we have actually a tool to make it really easy to do that. I'll you can show that in a second. Um, but this has your Rust code inside of this, uh, where is it, the source folder, I think. Yeah, so this is all the Rust code and we run this um, WASM build tool, which takes your Rust code and turns it into a WebAssembly file plus a um, d.ts file. Like it generates TypeScript types um, from the Rust code and just outputs it um, with some JavaScript glue code. Um, so you can write your code in Rust and then just run this WASM build tool and it'll generate like a JavaScript API wrapper for the Rust. But you have to run this manually. This is not automatically run by Dino Deploy. Thank you. Um, which actually brings up another point, like Dino deploy does not have any build step, right? Like you deploy something um, as is from your repository, which is great for, for many things. Uh, sometimes you want to deploy stuff from, uh, with a build step though. So like, if you want to do that, we have like integration with GitHub Actions. Um, so you can run your build step inside of GitHub Actions, which most people are already familiar with. Um, and you can just, uh, let me actually show you that. Uh, do I have an example of that? Um, actually, even in your example, I guess that the tests are not running at the moment, right? Uh, they're not running in CI. No, actually, let's do that in a second. Let's, yeah, let's add a GitHub Actions file to run tests in CI. That's a great, great point. Um, so yeah, so uh, we have this deploy CTL tool here, uh, which you can essentially do this inside your GitHub Actions. Um, which is just like you, you enter your uh, the name of your project, your entry point, and it deploys it to Dino you know, deploy. Um, and like you don't need to specify any any tokens or anything for that. Um, okay, so let's yeah let's set up uh, GitHub Actions. That's actually very a great idea. Uh, so if I go to this Actions tab here. GitHub obviously is very awesome and just supports Dino out of the box. So you can just press configure right here. And uh, let's just use the latest version because I trust the authors surprisingly. Um, and let's verify formatting, run the linter, run the tests. We don't need unstable. Um, and let's change the name here. Commit it. Let's see if that runs. There we go. Yeah, so this is actually the reason why we don't have a build step in Dino deploy by default, because like we usually are, without a build step, we're usually able to deploy before most other providers have even spun up like a VM to do your build step in. Um, and we don't need to spin up a VM or anything like that. Yeah, it's super impressive. It's just not realistic for a real world project yeah, without tests. Well, stuff. actually you would say that. Well, so, so um, yes, like you, you, so um, you will still need to run your test at some point, right? So the way we do this, for example, in Dino.land, this is also open source, let's get to the repo. Uh, it's this repo. So this is a fresh project um, and it has tests and these tests run inside of GitHub Actions. 
And what we do is we use pull requests for everything. Um, so when a user pushes something, let's actually not use that one. Let's do this one here. Um, when a user pushes something, we will um, deploy this immediately and then in parallel run the tests. And you can only run, you can only merge this PR once the tests are complete and the deployment is complete. Um, so this means we can like create the preview deployment really, really quickly. So once you open the PR, you have a preview deployment in like five seconds. Um, but before you can actually merge the PR, you still need to wait like 10 to 15 seconds um, to, to actually run the VM. Wait, wait um, so, so do you promote this version or you just create a new deployment when you deploy on the master branch? Uh, when we deploy the master branch, we, um, we create, so we essentially promote the deployment. It, it's like technically it is creating a new deployment with the same source code and the same environment variables and like the same everything. Um, but yeah, essentially you can think of it as promoting the- yeah, It's just an optimization to not build it again, but you don't need to build so. <laughs> yeah, but we don't need to build it. So like <laughs> yeah, for us, that optimization doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, so, so actually I'm, I'm doing the same um, in regard of uh, not running the tests on the master um, in order to deploys, to get faster deploys. I understand mm -hmm. this. Um, yeah, and like actually, so yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so one actually really cool thing that we do as well, um, which which you or you can do at least, um, we do this for the Fresh project, is that we can run live tests on your preview deployments. Um, so let's say you have a PR here. I have this PR for example, um, and I have my preview deployment here. This lighthouse um, test runs on my period deployment. Like it runs on like live production servers. Um, so like with all of the like live production um, set up. Um, so like I can run my tests on actual like production infrastructure um, to, to validate that everything works rather than just running it into like an isolated VM um, on on like some some system, which which may give you better, more accurate test results than. Um, it's the only way to do a performance uh, like lighthouse, like you did, for sure. Uh, let's go back to my GitHub Actions run. I think it completed, right? I I was like, did you pay any attention to it anymore? <laughs> yes, it did. Okay. Yeah, so 10 seconds. Dino's like, did I mention Dino's really fast? <laughs> um, yeah, ran, ran all the tests, um, checked linting and formatting and uh, everything's fine. Cool, uh, is there anything else that people wanna talk about or want, to dem or want me to demonstrate, which I talked about earlier? No, okay. Um, we still have 20 minutes. Uh, I can run through a couple more of the commands here um, or we can just be done at this point. Um, maybe let me run through the benchmarking thing, thing real quick because I had um, alluded to that earlier. So benchmarking works the same way that testing does in that you create a file called something underscore bench.ts. Um, and you can call Dino dot bench here uh, to register a new um, benchmark. It works exactly like testing um, list uh, posts. And this uh, function is the function that you're benchmarking. Uh, so we can just like list, uh, let's see, list posts. And if I run Dino bench, it'll benchmark it and uh, give me the result of how long it takes to run this, um, which is apparently uh, 97 microseconds. Okay. And it does this like, um, uh, yeah, it runs the test until the standard deviation becomes low enough that it considers it to be accurate. Um, so it's, it's pretty accurate. It's the same way that go test works. 
and I don't feel like rewriting this to be like the serial way, but I, I could show this to use this to prove that the parallel way is faster than the serial way, for example. Okay, um, cool. I don't have anything else. Um, unless folks have any other questions. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I don't have anything else. Okay, cool. Then uh, it was awesome um, having all you guys here today. Um, and if you have any other questions, we have a Discord server at Dino or at uh, discord.gg slash Dino. Um, you can join that and uh, yeah, ask any questions there. And uh, we have, if you want, if you, um, yeah, if you want to use that, then uh, I'm on there as well. Um, or you can message me on Twitter uh, at, at LCASDev. Um, yeah.